What's going on guys, Dan Watson, Learning Cameras, and I really wanted to make this video because uh, I did a review on the a7 III and I have a Facebook group as well, which you can join if you want to, but in that Facebook group, you guys have been posting a lot of your images and a lot of problems that you've been having with the camera and questions. And so I think this is a very important video because I wanted to outline those five biggest struggle points. And on, honestly, in some of these, this is ruining your images. So if you just got this camera, this is definitely something that you should watch and take a look at. Now, I do have a video that's either live or going live about the, uh, the entire menu system with this camera, how I set it up, how I, everything, detailed breakdown of every item in this menu, as well as a PDF for for each item explained, how I set up the camera, all that kind of stuff. So all of that is either here or coming, so you wanna check that out. But these are five things that you just really, really need to know because it is literally ruining people's photos. And this menu system, this camera is so complicated. For many of you, this is your first Sony camera, first mirrorless camera, but even if you're upgrading from the a6500, there is a lot new year here. So let's kind of go down this list of some of these things that you really need to know and understand before you take out and shoot this camera. So the first item in here is gonna be electronic front curtain shutter. Kind of complicated. If you've never heard of it before, don't feel bad. You probably haven't. And it is something that is enabled by default in this camera and is very different on how it works with these mirrorless cameras. So even if you've had it on a DSLR, it's gonna be a little bit different. And there are a lot of pros and cons to this feature. And this is one of the things that's ruining people's photos. This is silent shooting. So we're going to um, head to the menu system and you're going to go to the second column, which is your shooting menu. It has a little picture of a camera and a number two on it. And then you're going to go to uh, navigate to four out of nine. So this is your menu system right here, four out of nine. And the first thing you see is silent shooting, which we'll get to next. And the second one is your E front curtain shut, which is your electronic front curtain shutter. And it's probably enabled by default, but let's kind of break this down without getting too complicated. On a DSLR, you have a mirror in front of your camera and uh, in front of your sensor, and that is completely covering your sensor. And it also has a shutter in front of that sensor. What is nice about a DSLR is that when that mirror flips up, the shutter is already closed. And so it just opens, takes the picture and closes, and then you have your exposure. Well, on a mirrorless camera, there is no mirror and the shutter has to be always open. That sensor is always on, always live, similar to live view on a DSLR. And with that live always on sensor, that means that the shutter is all the way out of the image. And so in order for it to shoot a photo, your shutter actually has to close, which is your front curtain. Your front curtain of the shutter closes it takes the picture, your shutter opens, and then that rear curtain closes again, finishes the exposure, and then they have to clear out. That is a multi-step shutter mechanism. So the shutter is actually moving twice as many times as it is on a DSLR. Now, it's not any slower than a DSLR because the DSLR has to move the mirror two times, or well, yeah, one each way, one open, one closed. So the mirror is moving twice, and then the shutter is moving twice. Whereas on a mirrorless camera, your shutter is moving four times. So that is how it works on this. Now, your E front curtain shutter is actually going to enable a whole bunch of stuff, which is gonna make this so much better. And the nice thing about this, and I'll tell you why you wanna use it. Well, let's talk about what this is doing. So rather than having to close the shutter, uh, close your first curtain, it is actually going to take your image with the shutter completely clear. So the sensor is on, you're seeing your image, you're looking through the viewfinder, you hit click, your image starts being taken right away. It is using the electronics of a sensor to uh, electronically start capturing that image. Now, as soon as it's done, that shutter is going to come over the image and it's going to end the exposure with the shutter. So it begins it electronically, ends it with the shutter. Now, doing that is so much better because of a couple things. So, A, it's gonna reduce the shake. So on a DSLR, you have to deal with shake from the shutter and the mirror. On a mirrorless camera, you don't have the mirror, which is really nice, no shake from the mirror, but if you have that shutter that has to close, the front curtain that has to close on the shutter and then open the shutter again, you do have shake that can result from that shutter mechanism opening and closing. Now, 
These new cameras have gotten way better. You're not gonna see too much shutter shake. It used to be an issue with the early Sony cameras, but it's much better now. So that shutter shake is, uh, is something that's not as much of an issue, but if you're doing a super long exposure, you have this camera on a tripod, and you're really looking for the utmost in sharpness, that is a problem. You can get shake, and so this is one of the ways that you're going to get rid of that. The other is it's gonna make the image take faster. This is how Sony's calculating that 10 frames per second with the electronic first curtain on. And that is gonna mean that you're actually capturing the image electronically and then finishing the image with the shutter. And that is the fastest way. And the other thing it's gonna do is your viewfinder, when you're looking through the viewfinder and the shutter starts closing on you, your screen goes black. Happens on a DSLR, happens on a mirrorless camera. Every time that shutter has to go in front of the sensor, your image is going to be black. You're not gonna be able to see it. Now, if the image can be taken electronically starting, then the only thing that has to happen is the shutter has to close and then open again. That is very little time. That shutter is so fast that you're gonna have very little blackout on the camera. So you're pretty much gonna be seeing your image a lot more than you would on a DSLR or if you had disabled that feature. So those are some big pros. Here's the problem. You can get something called banding, and there's also an issue with high-speed sync, which we'll talk about. Uh, banding is when you are inside usually and you're dealing with certain LED lights, not very good LED lights usually, so at a concert venue, can happen indoors in a restaurant or something like that. With certain lighting conditions, you will, whenever you're capturing something electronically, which happens uh, anytime you're doing either silent shooting or in using the electronic shutter in any way, shape, or form, you can see banding in those lighting conditions. If you see that, this is a feature you need to turn off. Or if you know you're gonna be in a situation like that, where you're indoors and uh, you're gonna be in a concert, you're gonna be dealing with a lot of artificial lights that may not be prioritizing being constant, like these uh, LED video lights and stuff like that, you should be good with those, you shouldn't have any problems with those. However, some of these other LED lights, they have a flicker to them, and you're gonna be able to see that. It's gonna come off as banding. It is gonna show up as um, dark or purple, lines that are going through the image and it can completely ruin the image and there's very little you can do to correct this in post. So we want to avoid it whenever possible. And then also when you're using high-speed sync, this can result in lines in your image if you're capturing electronically. So if you need to, this is where you turn it off. So you can go to that menu item and go to E front curtain shutter and click on it and set that to off. When you do that, keep in mind your frame rate's going to go down a little bit. You will have more blackout, you will have to worry about uh, vibration if you're shooting anything super long exposure. So I, I'd probably leave it on, which is what Sony has defaulted, but you need to know that when you're in these situations, you might need to disable this. And that kind of leads us into the next thing, which is silent shooting, which is very, very similar to this. Now, silent shooting is going to, rather than uh, having the front of the exposure being taken electronically in the back with the shutter, it just exposes the entire image electronically. And the good thing about this is it's silent. There's no shutter, there's no moving parts whatsoever. So it's completely silent. So if you're in uh, something like a wedding ceremony or you know people are quiet around you, you're in a concert, you're in a venue like that, it is really cool because you can be taking images without anyone around you hearing them. So uh, my daughter has a recital or something like that and I can shoot in there all day long. No one will ever know that I'm taking an image other than seeing my camera. So really cool to be able to have. There are some downsides to it. One is the same banding issue that can happen with that first mode, the electronic front curtain, is going to be able to happen with this. So depending on the lights that you have available on you, you could notice banding, and you'll have to decide whether it's worth it to go silent mode in order to uh, possibly get banding and still capture the image, or you need to uh, just take it out of silent mode and then uh, you'll have noise on the camera just like any other camera that you will experience. So those are the main things. And the other thing with this is it can cause something called rolling shutter. Now if you're used to video, you're used to seeing rolling shutter because this is how video works. It is a completely electronic capture. It is like capturing in silent mode. And so what happens is the uh, image sensor is being captured from top to bottom and it takes a little while in order to do that. So any movement that you have during that time where it's capturing, it can skew it. And so you'll see that as what we call rolling shutter. Now, that could be an issue for you. It could not be an issue for you. If you have something fast moving and, and moving uh, parallel 
parallel to, actually, if you're moving perpendicular to your camera, that could probably be a big issue and that is a time that you would not want to use it. So if you have very slow moving or none moving objects, it is a really cool thing and it is nice to have. I do use it occasionally. Not as much if you wanna live in silent shooting mode, you'd want a camera like the Sony A9, which captures so quickly that you pretty much will never see any kind of rolling shutter or banding. It's very rare that you'll be able to see it in that camera because the sensor captures so fast. It is more likely that you'll see it in this camera. Make sure if you're in artificial lighting, you're watching out for banding. And if you are, are, uh, having moving subjects, you are watching out for rolling shutter. All right, so those are the long ones. The rest are gonna go much quicker, but the third one I wanna look at is your eye autofocus. This is a feature that is only pretty much in Sony cameras, I think, and it's only good in Sony cameras that I've experienced. And so this is a feature that is one of the best features about these cameras. So many people are raving on it. It's really cool. I use it all the time, but there are a couple things you need to know if you're not shooting with this feature right now, or even if you're just new to the a7 III. It has gotten so much better over time. And if you didn't like it before, you might really like it now. So in order to enable this, this is something that is not just always enabled. You actually have to push button a button in order to activate it. It works very similarly to like back button focus. So if you're someone who's used to back button focus, you're gonna be really used to enabling this. Here is how it works. Um, ideally, you need to be in two modes and your focus area is the first mode that you need to set. Ideally, you're gonna want that set to wide. And what that's gonna do is allow the eye autofocus to search for the eye anywhere in this huge area of the image. So that will enable the eye autofocus tracking pretty much across the entire frame. The other thing that you're gonna to wanna to do is you're probably gonna want your focus mode in continuous AF because this is going to intelligently track your eye moving forward, backward, all across the frame. So you want it continuously focusing and tracking uh, as the eye of your subject is moving no matter where they're moving. I mean, this thing is so good. If your subject is running, it can keep up with it. So really amazing. So those are the two things that you're gonna wanna set beforehand. And then you're going to want to customize this feature to a button. I have mine set to AF on. So anytime I hit the AF on button, it will enable uh, eye autofocus. I think by default, it might actually be the center button on the D-pad, but that's where I have mine set to. And I kind of use it just like I would back button focus. So head just a couple screens past, you're gonna be set in that same shooting menu second uh, column, and you're gonna be an eight out of nine. You're gonna see the very first custom key. Uh, you have actually three custom keys you can set all of your buttons differently for photos, for videos, and also in playback. So no matter where you are, all of these buttons on the camera can do something different. It's so cool, it's so amazing that this camera has so much customization. So click in that, and then you're gonna click whatever you want to define to that button. So for me, I'm in the third menu, and that's where I set the AF on button, and I click on that, and I can go to IAF, which is in menu four out of 22. So now, in order to uh, actually enable eye autofocus, you are gonna hold down that AF on button or whatever button you set it to, whether it was that center joystick, not the joystick, but the center button inside the D-pad, whatever you want, you hold that down, it will look for the eye, and then when it finds it, it will, uh, it will show you in a light, it will have a green thing that comes over the eye, and then you can hit the shutter button and take that image. So amazing feature, that is how you set it up and it's really cool to have available to you, but you do have to enable it, you do have to set it up and it will be a custom function button. So let's talk about something that's a little controversial on this. Uh, compressed versus uncompressed raw. This is something that's a little controversial because Sony does not have a compressed uh, lossless raw file. And so you have these two options of uncompressed and compressed. And if you're newer to Sony cameras, you might not know if there really is a quality difference. Do I want to enable it? Which one do I want to shoot? Uh, and so basically it works like this. Your uncompressed raw is going to be your top quality raw file. And compressed raw is compressing that image down to make it a little bit lower file size. And it is actually a pretty good difference. And I like shooting compressed raw. The only other thing you need to know about is in order to get this magical 10 frames per second that Sony talks about, you have to shoot compressed raw. And even on the Sony A9, that only shoots 20 frames per second in compressed raw. I think it's 12 frames per second if you're going uncompressed raw. So essentially, if you wanted 10 frames per second, you need to be shooting compressed raw. So you might wonder what are the disadvantages to shooting compressed raw? Well, if you're shooting a single image, not a whole lot. 
there really is virtually no difference. I mean, if you're shooting like uh, astrophotography or something like that, where it's really sensitive, you might want to enable uncompressed RAW. But for most purposes, you would be fine in compressed RAW, but there is a problem. When you switch between your single shooting to your continuous shooting for higher speed stuff, the Sony a7 III, and I think the R3 as well, is gonna drop that RAW file from a 14-bit RAW file to a 12-bit RAW file. That, if you're in compress, only if you're in compress, if you're in uncompressed, it will say 14-bit the entire time. That will amount to a lower quality image and something that you should be concerned of. So you will not get quite the dynamic range and detail and some of the other things that you would if you were shooting a 14-bit uncompressed RAW. So keep that in mind, it is very key. So if you're somebody who shoots in your single shooting mode and can remember that every time you switch to continuous shooting, you're either gonna lower your quality or you might wanna switch out of compressed RAW, then I would leave compressed RAW on because honestly, in most images, you will never notice that difference. However, once you start going into those continuous shooting modes, because it lowers your image quality, if you're someone who's always shooting in those modes, you will probably wanna leave and shoot uncompressed RAW. Now, I wish that Sony gave you the option of only enabling the drop from 14-bit to 12-bit if we were shooting, say, over eight frames per second or something like that, because honestly, I, I shoot continuous shooting all the time. I don't need eight frames per second all the time, so I might enable uh, compressed RAW all the time if they did that, or if they just gave us a lossless compressed RAW, that would be nice. But yeah, that is a factor. You must keep that in mind. Uh, if you're shooting Eight, it wants to shoot 10 frames per second, you have to enable compressed RAW, but keep in mind that it will lower your quality slightly. All right, last on the list, we have something called Live View Display Settings Effect. Now, if you're new to mirrorless cameras, it's something you probably don't know about, but when you're using a mirrorless camera, one of the nicest things is that you can actually see your exposure on the screen or in the viewfinder. So no more having to review your images to make sure you got the shot, no more chimping to look at the screen and be like, oh, is my exposure off? No, everything is going to be correct. Uh, the way that you're viewing it, whether you're in the viewfinder or on the screen, you are gonna be seeing your correct exposure which is really cool, except when you don't want that. And there are a couple times when you don't want that. Basically, any time where you are underexposing your image purposely. So if I have my settings to uh, underexpose my image, so I know that my image is gonna turn out either dark or black, what's gonna happen is I can't see what I'm shooting because it is showing me exactly how the final image is gonna come out and the final image is gonna come out dark. One of the times where you might be underexposing intentionally is gonna be when you're shooting flash. You know that you're going to be underexposing your background and underexposing your subject because you're gonna light them with the flash. If you're in the studio, you might be doing it so that everything is black. You can't even see the subject and you're only lighting them with your flash. If you're outside, you might be just using the flash as a fill flash. And then you could kind of go either way on this. But if you're in that situation, you are going to want to turn this off. What is that is gonna do is kind of turn your camera into a DSLR, which means when you look through the viewfinder or look on the screen, you're gonna see the image as if it was perfectly exposed, even though you're not exposing the image perfectly in camera. So this is where you change that. Go to menu and you're gonna be in that second shooting menu again. You're gonna be at a six out of nine as the place in the menu settings and all the way at the bottom is called live view display. Settings effect, I think it's on by default, you will wanna turn that off. When you do that, your camera is always going to be perfectly exposed when you look through the viewfinder and look at the screen. And then when you take your image, it will show up as dark or light or whatever your settings are reflective of. So you'll see the effects of your flash. Now, uh, yeah, that's basically it. So most of the time you're gonna want this on. It's one of the most amazing features of mirrorless cameras is being able to shoot and see what you are shooting before you even take the picture. It is so much better, so much easier to work with in so many ways. The only exception to that is really when you want to intentionally overexpose, underexpose, or if you're lighting your, uh, your photo with a flash or something like that. If you're lighting it with a constant light, then you would probably leave your live view display settings effect on. Again, that's pretty much it. If you wanna take a look at, you know, something else that you might wanna take a look at as I'll put a link right here, um, dual card slots, one is UHS-2, one is UHS-1. I did some tests running some speed tests with this camera using UHS-2 cards, UHS-1 cards, shooting raw to both, raw with JPEG to one and raw to the other, all kinds of different things to check the speeds and what cards you should buy. 
that is there. All of my recommended gear for this camera, I'll have a link to it below. Uh, we're talking about uh, battery grips, um, flashes, lenses, memory cards you should get. Something that this camera doesn't come with is an actual battery charger, so you might want one of those. Uh, those kind of things are all in there, all my recommended stuff for that. So. Thank you guys for watching. Again, if you want the full breakdown on this, uh, either wait, subscribe, or check out the link if it's posted right now. I appreciate you guys supporting me by using these links below and supporting the channel and all the ways that you guys do spreading the word. Thank you guys so much for watching. Check out the A7 III review and I'll see you very soon.